Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Sam and I make content about autism, ADHD and neurodiversity related stuff right here on YouTube. This is a bit of a different video and a bit of a special video because I am talking to my second cousin Orly who lives in LA and she is the founder of an organization called Build a Bees, which aims to build a strong and supportive community for neurodivergent girls. Now we haven't actually been much in touch over the years and it was only in the last few months that we realized what the other one was doing. Uh, so I thought you might enjoy a, com a longer conversation between the two of us talking about the organization and how she's aiming to bring community to neurodivergent girls in LA, but also as a conversation between autistic mothers with neurodivergent kids and about life and about growing up and all that kind of stuff. So grab a drink and settle down or grab some headphones and do some chores around the house while you listen. We did have a few technical problems during the call. There was quite a bit of lag. So if I look confused at points, it's probably due to that and not, not due to the conversation. So thank you so much to Orly for agreeing to join me on my channel. This is a really extra special edition of, um, you know, a kind of longer conversation. And this is a really special one because first of all, we have been planning this for quite a while, a couple of months now. And also, Oli is actually my, I, I always get confused. Is it second cousin? Second cousin. Yeah, That's second correct, cousin. Isn't yeah. My first glance of um, Sam was when she was a little tiny baby. And then we lost touch for a long time. And then there would be all these family gatherings where Sam wouldn't be there because she would be living her glam life. And then she got married in Holland and that was a whole family <laughs> thing that everyone except me went to because I was I live in Los Angeles and then just in a oh by the way announcement to my mom Sam's dad told me about this channel and then I discovered it and I've been kvelling which is a very Jewish word to everybody about this being my cousin and discovering that there are people here who follow her I'm very excited that's it's pretty cool it's actually it's the weirdest thing to know that you already know people who watched my channel yeah We've been kind of working on quite similar goals side by side, un completely unknowingly. So do you want to uh, tell, us, tell us all a little bit about what you've been doing? Yeah, so about five years ago, um, I discovered that my one and only child, my daughter Maxie, was autistic. Of course, being a girl, it took a couple of years for them to come to that conclusion. But what I knew as the mother of a young child uh, was that we would go to all these special classes and special groups and she would be the only girl and she was a very pink tutu ballet kind of girl who wouldn't talk to boys and still doesn't but um I just thought there must be lots of other girls feeling left out as well so in my naivete slash neurodivergence I had a set up a meeting for moms to pour into this place where I had paid for margaritas and decide to change the world with me one person showed up but I was not deterred <laughs> We had um, a get together in the park and a few people came. And about a year later, um, I started my nonprofit, which I had decided in a flash of inspiration to call Builder Bees, uh, because I read that the Builder Bees are the ones that build the hive and they're not the queens. And who wants to be the queen anyway? Because we all know about queen bees. So I wanted these cool without knowing it girls to come together. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about whether to call Builder Bees for girls with autism, for autistic girls, for girls with special needs, not to say anything at all because our parents of kids at that age didn't want any labels and they still don't. So now we say we're for neurodivergent girls and their allies. And we have an asterisk with a gender spectrum awareness um, disclaimer about what girls means. People, and it's very inclusive um, in the sense that my daughter, for example, has friends who come to our events. Um, we just started to be about friendship and we are about friendship. And people have challenged me to, you know, to be more specific about what that means. But it really is enough because, as we know, not having friends has physiological as well as psychological as well as potentially life ending uh, fallout. So it basically gets these girls who are feeling left out together to do things in a sensory friendly way, like a dance party in a sensory gym or a pumpkin patch visit, which is very big here before Halloween on a farm with pony riding and not in one of these crazy commercialized spaces. So 
that's what Builder Bees is. And then we had a setback, of course, for COVID, like everybody else. And we're trying to get ourselves up and running. So I just thought, well, you know, we're talking to Sam would be wonderful anyway. And she has all these, I don't know how many thousand subscribers, but Maxi, my daughter, knows exactly how many subscribers. Oh, her really? Mom, yes, her mom's cool second cousin, <laughs> Sam, has. Yes. I am the least cool person to my daughter. So she sees a picture of you and, you know, you know how to wear makeup and you're younger. So that already. I mean, up. I am just incredibly glamorous. That's yeah. all I'll say. You know, yeah. you are incredibly <laughs> glamorous and you have all these followers. So, yeah. And that's kind of uh, what uh, little kids see these days, isn't it? Like their, their, their mentality is completely different to when I grew up. And it was like, who was in the magazines? You know, it's like, yes. who's, who's on YouTube now? Well, probably TikTok. It's really interesting that you broadened the group. I don't know whether this that was kind of intentional because I feel like um, even when I'm trying to find groups for myself, if there are autistic groups uh, around, it's always very focused on there's got to be a goal. There's got to be a therapeutic aim. It's There's got to be something that is being done. And it's not just like, well, can we just meet each other, please? You know, exactly. so I think that's really amazing. and. Of course, I've been making friends with neurodivergent people my whole life because we kind of automatically seek each other out, right? Right. Um, but this is really this is really great, especially you know I think post COVID things are still more separated than they have been, um, and I and I think it's hard to make friends anywhere really. Um, but it's such a great idea. So you, is this in the uh, Los Angeles area? Where exactly do you function? Yes. Yes, it is the Los Angeles area. Obviously, while we're on Zoom, we could we had a broader reach, but we are doing live events now. So yes, the Los Angeles area broadly defined. We don't have a base. We don't have any money basically. So you know, I'm in this kind of catch twenty two. Uh, you know, what I still I guess is the beginning of the process where you need money to start programs and you need programs to show that you're worthy of a grant. So it's a kind of catch twenty two, and I just naively slash neurodivergently believe that I'm going to eventually run into a celebrity who has a neurodivergent daughter and Bob's your uncle, as I can say to a Brit. And, uh, you know, there'll be lots and lots of money. But there are other ways yeah. to do it too, involving, you know, going out for dinner and apparently and, pre and pretending to forget that until you're in the parking lot afterwards that, you know, that you were the whole purpose of dinner was to ask for money. You know, you're supposed to kind of schmooze and then go to the car and then say, oh, yeah, that thing. But I'm too neurodivergent and unfiltered for that. So I mean, it's kind of ironic that the systems that would allow autistic people to thrive are so inaccessible to us. The whole the whole system, the whole concept of, of charity and fundraising in that way, um, it's it's very uh, it's gate kept, isn't it? You know, yes. it's not something that is really easy for people to kind of just do with a great idea and lots of enthusiasm. It's like, OK, but then what? You know, it's kind of interesting because there are lots of different ways to be an activist I suppose there's lots of different ways to contribute and over the last um I'm like what's the year I'm trying I, I, have, I have a real trouble with, with time and stuff like that and so every time someone asks me how old are you or how many years ago is that I have to look at the, the clock and see okay what's the year and then work backwards but <laughs> I think it's been about three and a half years since I started and during this time I've thought a lot about kind of what it means to be an activist and um, I think that you have to lean into your strengths. I found something that I can do and it doesn't necessarily change the world but it reaches enough people that it could change something um, and I think that's that's important for anyone who wants to get involved making a difference doing something is that you don't have to be amazing at this or you don't have to be savvy at that like you can find somebody who, may, who maybe knows more about charity fundraising I could find someone who maybe knows more about you know lighting or something I've got a bit of a makeshift lighting setup going on today the autistic urge to kind of make a difference and do something is so strong right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I think that you know you want to grow growth is measured in terms of money and people attending and I tend to not think about that and think more about if I can change one person's life so for example actually the mum who already 
knew about you and was following you and said, oh my gosh, she's your cousin. And up went my street cred. Um, <laughs> so her daughter made friends through Bilderbees with another girl and they've had a few play dates. And our email, very old fashioned uh, way of reaching our membership. So our email this week focused on that. And it's really amazing because it's a success story. And so my kind of, again, naive slash neurodivergent reason for wanting to grow is because I want other girls to find that. You know, when I feel like quitting, I just say, okay, there's got to be all these girls out there who are feeling like there's something preventing them from making mistake, uh, making friends that they don't understand, or they just, they know they're autistic and they have trouble making friends or whatever it is. You know, I would just want them to find us. And going back to what you were saying before, I think so many people without knowing this is what they're doing, buy into the medical model, right? Of let's show up to this program, this social skills program and then that's going to help cure my daughter in this case. And I've had emails. Oh, tell me about your program. Tell me about your social skills program. And sometimes these people are people who by definition buy in because they're speech therapists or they're behaviorists. And I say, this is nothing to do with the program. This is for girls to get together and just be, which mm -hmm. it's hard to fundraise for because it sounds nebulous. And a lot of these parents, and sometimes they have a lot of other kids, neurodivergent or not, their schedule is really full, right? They're running from, you know, occupational therapy on Mondays to social skills on Tuesdays. They get to the weekend when we do a lot of our events and, you know, they want to go to birthday parties or they want to go to sports is a really big thing here, or they just want to have downtime because they've been running to therapies all through the week. So, you know, it's very hard for them to then get on the schedule. Oh, we're going to drive a significant way to go to a pumpkin patch that is neurodiverse friendly and, you know, my daughter could find friends. I think that's a lot of the struggle too, is that people expect sort of return on their, even if it's very limited money. And yeah. there's no price on just acceptance and finding friends. I mean, my daughter has neurotypical friends and that comes with its baggage. And then she had a play date yesterday with a neurodiverse friend and they could, you know, smell each other's butts and tumble around on their bed playing <laughs> games and scooter around the playground and squirt whipped cream in each other's mouths to see if that makes it taste different and you know not worry about conforming and having a great play date which does all kinds of things as we know for you know the chemistry of our brains and our bodies it's not just oh I have a friend you know yeah and it's funny you know the the, the focus on kind of social skills because it's uh, it's like you know, what builds social skills better than being in a safe space with people that understand you? And exactly. it's like, I, I, I don't disagree that neurodivergent people could benefit from social, from building social skills. I don't think that neurotypical social skills are necessarily the pinnacle of, you know, the be all and end all, all the time. I think that neurotypical people, I say neurotypical people, you know, general, this is a very big generalization, but, you know, people aren't great at communicating across the board. And, um, you know, I know studies have shown that, that, that kind of we communicate better with each other. And, and I think that if you give that safe space, then you will be building social skills because you'll be relaxed, you know, and you can't exactly. learn anything when you're not relaxed. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Anxiety is a, is a huge barrier to, to making friends. I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking that, you know, what are social skills and what is, you know, the development of compassion and, and self-awareness? And, you know, I think sometimes that Maxie and her peers, her neurodivergent peers who had early intervention, you know, because we have to also live, deal with the fact that we're living at an unenlightened time. So we have to do some of the medical model, right? Um, they, they end up a little bit ahead because they're all, they have a vocabulary at a much earlier age you know to to refer to all these things that are skills that other kids don't have to think about but something happened recently that you know I was so proud of Maxie for and I felt like she was ahead of her neurotypical peers so she did something that was a little not so socially savvy and she wrote a long explanation and letter of apology to her friends and she wrote sometimes I'm just not so good in the moment because I'm autistic mm -hmm. and she was really you know taking accountability and apologizing and there were no apologies from the other side. So, you know, I consider that an advantage for her. There's sometimes the kind of unfiltered, you know, wanting to tell the truth. She, she is better at lying than she was, which actually makes me feel like, oh, good. You know, that's a skill that's important to kind of obfuscate. But then she knows it doesn't, 
she doesn't take it all the way. So then we get to the truth and we get to an honest conversation. And and yeah. I guess the important thing is that that, that um, you know, weakness or flaw, I don't want to really want to use those words, but, but, you know, she's saying I'm not so good at this because I'm autistic or something like that. That's a huge difference from kind of like, certainly where I, when I was that age and I just was trying to hide with shame all these things that I felt just shouldn't be there, these horrible flaws of mine that I was so ashamed of. And I couldn't even imagine thinking, oh, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. I'm totally allowed to have these flaws. I feel quite optimistic when I think about, well, your generation and my generation raising our children now in a world where it's okay to talk about mental health, finally, or it's okay to talk about the things we're bad about, yeah. um, things we yeah. struggle with. Now people are starting to ask me about, you know, how we serve the needs of, of kids in the schools I, I teach in, the school my daughter goes to, a school, even a school I used to go to and used to teach at. I mean, that's how my activism is really through my profession, which is education. Um, and But then this is something which I deeply believe in, again, because of my daughter, but also because of what I've discovered about myself and my increased understanding of what it means to be an autistic, especially autistic female. Um, and, you know, my big challenge, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to have this conversation, is where are all these girls? You know, where oh, are they around? Oh, they're around and yeah. what can break through. I feel like we need, again, you know, I always say idealistically slash neurodivergently, you know, I'm holding on to this vision or maybe just wisely, I hope, you know, I'm holding on to this vision that there will be a breakthrough, whether it's through this conversation, whether it's because I meet somebody with the means and the energy to help. I mean, I've, you know, I've uh, been knocked down and I'm trying to get back up again because sometimes you find somebody who's really great with social media, really good with marketing or fundraising. They're on your board, but then it's not their priority because it's not their passion and they get busy with other things and they can't follow through because we're all busy. So, you know, that's the big challenge. The publicity so market. let's just do, let's just do a little call to action then. If somebody is in the Los Angeles area with a daughter of the ages between, what are we saying? You know, I, I started off, I mean, my daughter's age kind of dictated it at first, but then it was another, you know, not so calm discussion sometimes with my board members of, well, do we have to give an age group? And on the one hand, we do, because people want, people, you know, define, you know, where their kids should go by age group as well as other things. But also, what if there's somebody who's 15 and still playing with dolls, you know, and there's no judgment around that? What if there's a three-year-old who, you know, whose parents have just discovered a diagnosis and they're desperate to come to something like this? So, you know, my compromise is, uh, you know, say ages, you know, five to 11, but please, if you're interested, call me anyway to try to be a bit more inclusive. So, so yes. I will, I'll, put the, I'll put the yeah. website down below. So if you're interested, um, please go check that out because I just think it's such a wonderful thing. And like, I, it's, it's the thing that I would have wanted as a, as a child. And probably, I think you probably feel that way too. I definitely you know? do. Yeah, I definitely do. And some of the people who are on the board are people whose kids I taught and, you know, with or without, whether or not they're embracing of a diagnosis or would have a diagnosis, these, these moms have said, I'm on this board because what all is providing is exactly what my daughter should have had or my daughter should have had. And, when we had our um, fundraiser recently, our, our trivia night, where your definition of autism played played a part and really got through to people, and I did a pitch, there were people who did have some aha moments and gave some money as a result of that. So, you know, it, it's we do, again, think of reach in terms of numbers, but let's think of it in terms of one conversation. If there's one girl at a time who, who we can bring into the fold and who, you know, they go to school how many hours a week, you know, feeling like they're less than or other than or there's something wrong with them and of course this is a whole other topic but teachers can play into that too messages from other kids other parents to have just a couple of hours at the weekend you know yeah. you go and know that they are going to have play dates too when they hear their other friends setting up play dates between you know between themselves you mentioned kind of like people having their aha moments um did you have a moment or when when your daughter was diagnosed how many years ago was that uh she was diagnosed about five or five years ago five years ago. okay and and so at, at what point in that did things begin to click for you 
you know, I suspected something was off, but even with my long career in teaching, I didn't know enough about autism to know that certain things were a manifestation of that. Um, so for example, she would go to these parent and me groups. So we went to a Shabbat one and other people would say, oh, the other two-year-olds, three-year-olds would say, oh, the candles and then organize them. And Maxie would just throw it all on the floor or other kids would know what to do with crayons and she would just systematically take all the paper off them. And I noticed that. And now I would say, well, that's a red flag right there. But I knew there was something. Um, she had a big event when she, she went through a regression um, following something that looked like a seizure to her preschool, but, but wasn't. I think one of the aha moments I had, which is really important for people to understand beyond lacking social skills, sensory issues, but the, the real cognitive issue here is when she got to the age, you know, four or five nearing kindergarten, an age at which uh, kids can, for example, summarize a story. So what's Cinderella about? And they can tell you basically what the story is. She said, Cinderella has a blue dress. And I thought this, and then I read about salience mm -hmm. and all of that. And I realized really what autism is about is a struggle with coordination. Coordinating the body sometimes, but also coordinating input and coordinating relevance. So then when they go to school, they have a lot of issues with that socially, but also academically. Um, and so that was a really big aha moment when she did that right around the time that she was diagnosed. I mean, there's a whole, there's a lot of judgment on parents. Oh, you're in denial. It's so obvious. And then what I keep telling people is the denial is really a stage of grief. And mm. you're, it just takes a while to, to, you know, get all the evidence to really pay attention to the evidence. And what I said to myself was, you know, I don't really care what you call this in the end. I don't care. I remember thinking, I don't care if you call it purple broccoli syndrome, because I love broccoli and the purple's my favorite color. I don't care what you call it. It has to be addressed for her sake. Um, so I guess that's a lot of aha moments because it was really a gradual thing. There were these kind of pit in the stomach realizations really early on because I studied early child development. Um, but yeah, there was the, the Cinderella one was a really big one for me as a teacher. And how did you... Um turn around those feelings which you described as sort of grief which I only assume is is kind of based on well as, as a parent I assume that feeling is based on fear it's like fear fear for the future and for me kind of like a, a sort of spiraling what if they never do this and what if they never do that kind of thing and and suddenly it seems because I, this is this is this is not actually from my own experience this is me kind of projecting your, your feelings onto what I'm yeah. saying yeah. um but how did you turn it around from that kind of state into seeing things in a more kind of neurodiversity affirming light? Yeah, I think um, it's an ongoing process. I don't think it's just one, you know, suddenly you're kind of over it. But I think it was really understanding what autism means. You know, I mean, the conflating of Asperger's with autism, I think has done a lot of, it set a lot of people back from getting their kids diagnosed. So when I heard, because when she was three, you know, she was, she was going backwards and, you know, she didn't have skills that she used to have. And it was very, very painful. But then when people said, oh, well, what this is going to look like by kindergarten is probably Asperger's. I thought, oh, well, OK, you know, and, and, and that's what we need to all understand is that it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, you know, it, it's I think the process of knowing it was neurodivergent came from being educated about the social model versus the medical model. It came from a lot of reading. It came from realizing a lot of things about myself and self-diagnosing. Um, it came from Greta Thunberg and realizing, you know, what that hyper-focus, what a gift. I mean, people use the word superpower, which I hate, but just what a what an advantage it can be. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of reading and talking to people. Some people don't want to find other people in the same situation, but I really wanted to. And I had taught a lot of siblings of neurodivergent people at my school and I went back to them and they were very, very eager to get in touch and put me in touch with more resources. So I was very proactive and just sort of whatever my, my process was with grief, just keeping going out and finding that village, whatever that village was at the time. Um, so it's a long answer as ever, but I think, I think um, it's a thing. You said a lot of things and then you said, oh, and then the, my self-diagnosis, that was sort of like this little thing in the middle, which I, I really want to know more about how, when that happened and, and when you started connecting the dots between your yeah. daughter and, and yourself? 
Yeah, so so I have a very good friend in England, and she said to me a while ago, have you ever thought that you're autistic? And I said, well, no. Um, and she said, and she cited something that used to be a real pattern of mine, which was having really intense friendships with other girls in school and women in college or whatever, really intense friendships, and then they would implode. Um, and I, I didn't know then, and only recently did I discover really how to talk about anything, any kind of conflict. Um, and so I kind of dismissed it, but then in reading about parents of daughters with autism and, and in reading about, in reading accounts of autistic women about their own lives, I mean, Hannah Gadsby is the most probably well-known one, I realized that, you know, big feelings and intensity and all of this, you know, just was a sign of autism too. And so I started just noticing things about myself as I was reading. And then also talking to this friend about, for instance, you know, it's funny because it's so it's so built into baked into my life that it was hard to recognize it. But somebody talks about something and I will say, oh, that reminds me of this. And people are going, that's nothing to do with what I was thinking of. And I said, well, I drew a line from here to here. And then I used to feel bad about that. But now I say, look, I think it could be a gift that I'm going from here to here. But I also try to do in my grown up life what I do at school, which is to say, when I'm teaching kids, you know, well, where are they? Let's try to stop mm -hmm. and read and pay attention to what they are doing. I think that I've been an observer of how to do life as opposed to just spontaneously living life. You know, I watch children, this was another aha moment. I watch children see each other and automatically just search, seek each other out for conversation. And the thing that other kids wanted, my daughter was scared of. And I just recognized that I was too. And of course, as she's got older, she's more and more of an age that I remember. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she's now almost 10, which I think, I mean, I remember before 10, but I remember 10 really well. Do you feel that after you kind of said, yes, I am kind of thing, you gave yourself the stamp of approval. Did it take a while for you to process it as part of your identity? Because for me, mm -hmm even when I got an official diagnosis, it was, there was a lot of going back and going, oh, that's why that happened. And, and all these memories were just, it was like, you know, the dust was being kicked up out of the corners of my mind kind of thing. And yeah. so for me, it was a huge kind of process of reintegrating this new information and yeah. almost like revisiting the past and saying, okay, well, these glasses are no good. Let's try these new ones on. Um, exactly. how, how was this process for you? Yeah, you know, I've done this a lot through writing. So I'm in a creative writing class. The idea is to produce a book. I don't know if I ever will. But the idea of the book is to teach about neurodivergence, especially in girls, through my experience and my experience of Maxie as her mom. You know, so there are so many things that she's going through that bring flashbacks to what I went through. And absolutely, that's a very good way of talking about of talking about it, the metaphor of the dust, because I've gone back and thought, oh, that fight with my roommates when I was in my 20s. Oh, you know, that overreaction to this. And I still have it. And I think the final frontier is being able to go, say, to apply for a job or to have something happen in your job and say, that's because I'm autistic. That's the final frontier that I'm not quite at because, you know, this is a whole other conversation. But, you know, people are talking about diversity all the time. Certainly my neck of the woods and my profession but they don't quite do neurodiversity with the same amount of pride and acceptance and you know on a practical level level you know revealing it to parents and then by extension revealing it to kids it's very no no we don't want to lose their business you know um, and I want, wanted to get the job so I didn't know as much as they were impressed with me whether I could go to that final revelation so I think that is the next step. I mean, I am dreaming of a world that I hope our kids will see, even if we don't, where just like homosexuality was in the DSM 30 years ago, and nobody would think of having it in there now, um, mm -hmm. in 30 years, this stuff will not be in the DSM because it will not be a disorder. You know, it'll that's, be another that's the thing that I find really interesting is that there's so many different aspects of autism and... Um, I, I mean, I, so I'm not somebody who thinks that, oh, we don't need any therapy or any treatment because there's a lot of autistic people who uh, do need speech therapy or occupational therapy, like absolutely. But it part of me thinks that saying, oh, well, we're going to treat the autism or we're going to therapize the, the autism. It's like, well, okay, what are you actually, which bit? Because 
you know, are you helping people speak? Are you helping, are you building social skills? Are you, and, and I think that the, the, the deficits, if you want to kind of see it like that, um, is something that you can't just say, oh, autism is the deficit, you know, exactly. because it's just like, that's like saying, you know, broccoli is the deficit, you know, it exactly. doesn't make any sense. To exactly. Me. Um, exactly. Yeah. But like much more of a focus on does this people, does this people, does this person need support and in which area? Because at the moment there is no, I mean, I know that ABA is kind of like a very huge thing over there and it's sort of, as far as I can understand, marketed as this sort of like catch all. It's like, you're autistic? Well, let's throw them at the, throw the, their spaghetti self at the ABA wall and, and kind of see if it sticks. You know, autistic people have such diff diverse needs. Exactly. And for the, for the DSM to be a, a kind of, a, well, it's a diagnostic manual, but it doesn't really give, a diagnosis doesn't actually give any information. Exactly, exactly. And again, um, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, that was a really roundabout way of trying to express a thought no, that I, I had kind of I, half formed. So I'm like, no, it's it's looking a bit painful because of it, you know, that's why. <laughs> it's at least 80% formed. But, you know, I, I, you know, because... I've been trying to do a good job of not jumping in because that's one of my deficits, right? Is uh, is jumping in and interrupting. But um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I think that it's really important to distinguish, and I do this, uh, you know, really explicitly with Maxi, between what she needs to work on in the service of her relationships with others and what she doesn't because it's her. So repetitive restrictive interest is a really good example. She has is just coming out of a phase of having a repetitive, restrictive obsession with this 15-year-old YouTube star, right? So if she needs to, you know, go into her retreat after using all this social energy, you know, and just, as long as it's appropriate, watch Piper Raquel with herself, that's great. If she cannot change the topic, lighting. You have glow. I know. I'm desperately trying to turn the other one on now. <laughs> I'm not distracted. I know, but you know what? Now I can see that your ears glow. So that's, it's all in the service of approaching yeah, the need. This may take a while. Please continue. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so repetitive restrictive interests. So if she's out in the world and now that she's almost 10, other kids are noticing that she cannot stop going on about this topic and it's annoying them, that's when we need to work on it. So it's not the repetitive restrictive interests that are the problem, right? Same with, same with interactions, other interactions. Who cares? Who cares if kids are not making eye contact with you? Who cares? Mm -hmm. that's, that's other people's baggage. I mean, every April for autism um, celebration month, <laughs> I, I throw out questions for people, you know, because this, this is the radical inclusion, right? that I subscribe to, which is, nice. is if there's a problem with these people, you know, just like with the, you know, LGBTQ community, right? If you have a problem with homosexuality, why do you have the problem? Not what do we need to correct, right? Mm. So same with this, you know, yes, it, 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 with autism, it's slightly different because things can bother other people. So you know, not changing the topic can bother other people um, or, um, you know, not giving people personal space um, you know, which my daughter has struggled with not um, giving her friends personal space because she's so excited to see them. And then that has cost her a couple of friendships. So that those are things to work on. But whether or not she looks at you, I just feel like that's someone else's problem. If, you know, if she's, if she's totally, you know, appropriately interacting, but she's not making eye contact for all the reasons we now understand, mm -hmm. so what? If she's in her room at the end of a busy day, you know, indulging her repetitive restrictive interest, so what? It's when it bothers other people that then the perspective taking mm. needs to be, you know, honed up a little bit. But you know, it doesn't. Yeah, but it's not just it's not just bothering other people though. It's it's um, it's realizing that <laughs> this is not a good way to make friends. You know, it's, well, that's it's what understanding. I mean. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's 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 understanding that um, you know, you can do whatever you like, really. Yeah. But if you want to maintain relationships yeah. these are the expectations yeah. you know that, that the vast majority of people you meet will have yes. and and as far as i'm concerned I, this may not be a popular opinion but 
you know, eye contact may be one of that. It's not that she has to do it, but that, you know, that that people know that that's an expectation, right? Which yes. I'm sure that you know, I'm sure that most autistic people probably have it drummed into them if if they are particularly you know averse to it. It's probably something that that's been heavily focused on, um, to the detriment of focusing on other things. But um, you know, it's 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 sometimes somebody telling you explicitly these are the expectations because that's not something that we might naturally pick up, right? You know, exactly. and so it is helpful. But it, it's it's the balance between helping somebody, giving somebody the information by saying that people have these expectations, but also not giving somebody the pressure of saying you have to be like that. Exactly. You know? exactly. That's kind of the balance, isn't it? Right. That's a much better way of, of saying what I said, which was bothering other people. Yeah. By that, I meant, you know, which is with her friends, it's going to you know threaten the continuation of the friendship. I mean, and now we're at the age, you know, Max is at the age where her friends are noticing some parents are reinforcing and explaining to their kids that this is you know the different way that max's brain works or whatever they want to say the thing is really to recognize it in the moment you know so i have maxie has a good friend whose mom is very supportive but you know we were at the beach one day and maxie said something unfiltered to her friend and the mom said don't you ever worry that if maxie continues like this she's going to be socially isolated and i said this is why I set up filter peaks. This is what I worry about all the time. This, you know, is what I mean when I, you know, advertise all these events that you send your daughter to, you know? So sometimes people don't stop and think, well, that thing that has been pontificated about is happening right now. Um, mm. But, you know, acceptance is really, you know, Maxi, you can go on and on about a topic and you can, you know, be very dysregulated, but I love you anyway, right? You're my friend anyway. That's what we, that's what we need to get to. Yeah. So. And I think that the, the acceptance thing is really hard when people don't know what they're looking at. Exactly. You know? It's like that. I think people have a very intuitive grasp. I think people generally can identify autistic people quickly. You know, especially girls at school, I think they know there's something off with you kind of, you know, within a matter of seconds, uh, no matter how good you are at masking. But, um, oh gosh, I've completely lost my train of thought now. But they don't know what, yes, they don't know what it looks like in any given but moment. They, they, and they may not be consciously thinking, oh, they're an autistic person, how, whatever. And what I think you? that's like, I think that is the problem, actually, because the they problem. think, oh, that they're weird that, that that's the word that kind of comes instead of of an understanding of like autistic that's an autistic person that's that's very dehumanizing you know she's an autistic person and that's why she does this this and this because i think the problem is autism is a lot more complicated to understand than for example homosexuality you know it's pretty straightforward you know he doesn't like uh he doesn't like girls he likes boys okay <laughs> You, know, you yes. can say it yeah. in a in a sentence, um, and yeah. and autism requires a much deeper level of understanding, especially because you meet one autistic person, then you meet another one, and you're like, well, they're nothing like them. Right. Um, so it's really difficult, isn't it? It's difficult, and it's difficult to really define the accommodations because I mean, this was the first blog I wrote for the website. Is you know, you know, if you want to accommodate somebody, if you want to include somebody in a wheelchair in a school, what do you need to do? You need to build a ramp amongst other things. What do you do for this? What do you do for anxiety? I mean, one thing I know I do, because I have a lot of, you know, undiagnosed kids I come across, is for example, if I see that they're just, that they're, there's too much going on in their body for it to be able to sit in a, a chair and, you know, do school, they always, they just have a signal, they can go do jumping jacks or they can take a lap around the hallway or, you know, so it's to look at, it's, it's changing the lens from, oh, I had this great lesson and this kid can't sit still to, hey, what's going on? And that's why I think the more transparent you make it to kids early on and to parents and not worry about the parents getting upset or having the reaction that I had at first. So it, it's very, very, it, a lot of it is that one word stigma. Um, so I think, you know, you're right. Homosexuality and autism are not completely analogous, but the stigma has definitely decreased. There's less of a, I don't think it's gone completely, but, you know, people usually don't think it's the right thing to send them to corrective institutions, right? If people, if, say, kids turn out to be gay, right? Um, and with with uh, autistic people, 
yes, they do need more intervention for all the reasons we just talked about, but there doesn't have to be a stigma. Mm. So that's, I think that's the difference. If we look at it differently, they'll look at it differently. And I think that's also kind of plays into the whole, you don't look autistic thing, because if you just kind of accept yourself and your, your quirks and your, you know, vulnerabilities and, and everything, um, you end up not looking autistic sometimes, you know? Well, that's exactly. That's exactly why Builder Bees is all about creating an environment where people are going to bring down the stress. Right, because just just as soon as you, and it's also, we talk a lot about what to do for parents, but as soon as you go to an event or a workshop or whatever, um, workshop not being to correct the kids, but to do a girls empowerment workshop, that's one of the things we've had a guest do, um, then, you know, you just relax because you don't worry about anyone's judgment because you're all dealing with the same thing. It's just such a relief to not have to worry because I feel like I am pushing for the social model while still living in the orbit of the medical model we've talked a lot about our family and you know privately and and i think that for me it comes from being socialized to try and fit in and conform at every stage and that is by being as normal and unobtrusive in life so that you don't get noticed you know yeah. um and from what i can tell you're kind of nodding that's kind of something that that was impressed upon you too Absolutely. Well, I, I had selective mutism, you know, I had anorexia, I, you know, tried to make myself consciously or unconsciously, I tried to make myself disappear, I, w I couldn't find my voice. Absolutely. I mean, uh, so Sarah Lonsett, who is um, a young, very successful musician and singer, um, she wrote a song when she was in her teens that we've embraced as our anthem for Build the Bees. Um, and it's called I Will Rise. And the refrain is I want to be heard. I mean, that is the bottom line. I still um I still get very triggered is a very LA word, right? When I, um, when I don't feel hurt, you know, and, and oh. this whole notion of saying to kids, well, what do you think? Or, you know, Maxie will say to me, can you start with the positive? And so when I do, it makes all the difference. It shows that I'm listening to her and we all want to hear the positive. Before yeah. We're yeah. I think we definitely have some similar intergenerational stuff going on. Well, the intergenerational stuff is really interesting because we kind of, we've talked about trauma. We're both obviously descendants of, I guess, Holocaust survivors would be the correct term. And, yeah. uh, you know, we know a lot about how trauma is passed along the genes in a really sort of weird way, whether that's, uh, well, purely genetic and then the behavioral aspect as well. I, yeah. I think that there, there's been so much work done by certainly parents around me of, of this idea of breaking cycles yes you no know, um i i can see things that happen to my parents and i'm like yeah that's not okay right you know and it's like you have to really be kind of woken up to this thing yeah um and then address it and it's it's pretty painful to address these things isn't it you it's know? very painful and you feel like because it's a chain it's hard to turn it around but one thing, I mean, I've made a lot of parenting mistakes, a lot of mistakes in general, but one thing I'm proud of is I think that I have at least done something to break that pattern with Maxie because she is definitely, she is definitely heard. Um, you know, sometimes I think I've gone too far to the other extreme. So I was raised to, I was so upset when I was growing up because I wasn't, I don't know if this was around when you were a kid, when you came of age as it were, but Top of the Pops and Grange Hill. I was not allowed to watch Top of the Pops or Grange Hill. And I was so upset. Only when the babysitter came could I watch these things. You know, everything was so don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about sex. Don't talk about what body parts are really called. All of this. And so when Maxi started going on the internet, I was like, go girl, you know, and then probably. And then you're like, wait, no, don't actually. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, she went a little bit. It went a little bit too far. But um, yeah. Yeah, so I've had, we've had to rein it back. But, you know, I, I so we often do that, right? Sometimes we you know, unconsciously repeat patterns from our parents. Sometimes we make such an attempt to do the opposite that we go too far yeah. the other way. But I, I do think this notion of being heard, um, anybody, I don't know if you can find the link quickly because you are a millennial, but Sarah Lonsett, I Will Rise, it's fantastic. I will, I'll put the link in the description box because I'm a millennial, you know, I know how to do that. That's right, you can do that just by, just by thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, now that I have a platform with, now a really significant amount of people um 
I always feel like I get, a, I, I don't know if this is based on anything apart from my own internal fears. I always feel like people kind of assume that I'm a lot more confident and used to this than I actually am. And uh, I guess the thing about feeling heard is that I didn't feel heard until I had not, not even people hearing me until I had a platform where I was just like, okay, I'm just going to talk. And if one person, if 10 people hear me, then I'm still, I am still expressing my truth there, you know, exactly. and, and that's still only in the last, you know, four years that I even was able to do that because, yeah. because I went through life thinking no one, no one wants to hear what I have to say. Yeah. Um, even if they do want to hear it, I'm not very good at expressing it. Um, obviously, you know, you do get better with practice. I was, I was not, I was not quite so uh, articulate, you know, when I was starting. And I also found the very first YouTube video I made ten years ago. And oh, I want to see that. Oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing. The the thing that I noticed the most, and I'm like, did pregnancy drop my voice, or did I used to speak with this little baby voice or something? Because I'm like, hello, YouTube. Um, so nice to see you. <laughs> no, I, I am totally not that. sharing this. But I did like, know the search on that. It's, it's, it's a it's a journey, right? Isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. for me, you know, it felt like everyone else learned these things as a teenager. I think that's adolescence is kind of where you're meant to figure yeah. out who you are socially. And I didn't. I had no idea who I was when I was 18 and probably when I was 25. And I feel like only now with all the bits of information coming together, the ADHD was an important one too, because that is a huge part of internalized shame for me. Um, it's only finally clicking together. And, and I think that's, and maybe that's pretty common for neurodivergent women or absolutely. neurodivergent people. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's all relative, right? Because I look at you and think, oh, you're a lot younger than I was when I came to this realization, because I only became a mom when I was 43. And I only really started thinking about it like around the age of 50. And, you know, I'm still at the grand old age of 53 you know working on figuring out how it all fits together I mean and executive functioning is another big one right like organizing you know there are people who seem to be able to I don't know meditate and put on makeup before taking their three kids to school and then you know cook a meal from scratch for 10 people and I just I don't know if it's the the will or the energy or the just what it is you know, that I don't have that would allow me to do that. The energy, the energy in a deeper word than not having the energy, you know, the energy in a very deep rooted kind of energy. Executive function. Yes. It's like you want to do the thing, so you get up and you do it. And I'm exactly. like, absolutely. Having started on ADHD meds and finally starting to get to the point where I can even set myself a deadline, meet the deadline and then, and then continue. I'm like, is this how everyone else works? Because that's really unfair. It's really easy like this. Exactly. <laughs> it's so much easier than struggling through. But yeah, this is very wonderful. And if even, as I say, one person out there is lives in LA or is coming to LA or knows somebody in LA who just in any way, shape or form might be a potential builder bee, you know, they did something, they set up something. My friend, the same friend in England said, oh, did you base builder bees on the yellow ladybugs and I said what's yellow ladybugs it is something they did in Australia exactly the same kind of model and mission and reasoning for autistic girls and they managed to they managed to find a whole bunch of autistic girls who didn't have the kind of birthday parties they wanted so they just threw the birthday parties and all the funding and everything they would have needed to get that going I don't seem to be able to find I know that this can happen I know well, I wish you all the best in finding that celebrity with that daughter. You know, I, I think that's actually kind of a feasible, uh, a feasible model. You know, it's certainly the sort of route that I would have taken. That's where my yeah. brain would have taken me. This is the obvious solution, isn't it? Well, especially um, if you're so near to Hollywood, right? You just kind of troll around holding a, an Oscar exactly. from the one of the gift shops. Yeah, right. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic to talk to you. And I know that we could probably talk for hours, hours um, yeah. about all manner of different things so one last time for people who are interested can you just tell us you know they need to be in LA and they need to have daughters between the ages of well und undetermined but you know yeah. primary primary school age is probably primary the school elementary school in LA is the probably the best way of just you know just quickly summarizing the age group that we usually have attending our events 
But if your daughter is outside of that age range, please still get in touch. The best way of reaching me is orly at buildabeesla.com. And my okay. cool millennial cousin will now put that in the chat. Well, yeah, I'll I'll make it flash across the screen and twinkle and stuff, you know. Wow. <laughs> wow. But I will put the details in the description box below. It's been really nice to talk, and I almost wish there'd be like a part two where we can dive into deeper issues. But, you know, we'll start here and take it easy. But I hope that you enjoy your Sunday in LA, because that sounds really dreamy. Uh, That's really and... Yeah. <laughs> Let me know what you think of the topics that we've talked about in, in the description box, whether whether they resonate, um, whether there are any parents watching with, with daughters, maybe not in L.A., but who are kind of interested in this concept. I think it's um, such a valuable, such a valuable thing to do and to be a part of. So, like, you know, congratulations on even getting this far. Thank you. Yeah. Any college age females or female identifying any teenagers anybody wanting to be a mentor as well that's a, that's been a very powerful um kind of point of contact for a few people who've been part of our journey so far yeah wow definitely so do get in touch with Orly um as you can tell she's super friendly and awesome like me so you know <laughs> there's nothing to be scared of well thank you so much to Orly for for coming on again uh it's been really great too thank you bye a big thanks to Orly for coming on the channel and talking to me and please let me know if you like this kind of content, if you really like having these longer interviews. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Take care everyone and see you later. Bye.